I don't, I'm not very popular when I say these things, but our lifestyles do not fit. There's no other organisms. We're the only organism on the planet that's doing the things that we do, um, constructing things, uh, taking lithium, mining beyond belief, destroying ecosystems because we want more things. Uh, that's just not a future fit. I can't see how the biosphere is going to be biodiverse and continue uh, well in the future uh, without human beings being willing to make some changes, particularly modern day human beings. Um, I think indigenous peoples have had less of that footprint and we should learn from their reciprocity. Thank you everybody for joining us this evening for a discussion of wows, as if there aren't enough wows in the world, these are the best. So I'll just tell you what I know about Doug Zook and Dave Morimoto. Uh, both of these gentlemen have uh, played a significant role in our understanding of the biosphere and how life is the most powerful force on earth. Uh, both of them were colleagues of Lynn Margulis who created a new view of evolution. It's not all about competition. It's also about collaboration. And there is so much to be learned from that. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, welcome everybody. Great to be able to join you today. And in a sense, uh, we're all in our living rooms or wherever, but we're gonna be introducing you to the living rooms of our ultimate home, not just the home we're sitting in, but the biosphere. And, and really, really, I think it's great if we can get in the habit, all of us, of referring to the environment as the biosphere. Environment can be the environment of this room, environment next door, but biosphere is specific. And it's what we should be talking about more in our policies and in our world of building a better world. We want to really connect and be within the biosphere rather than outside of it the way we are now. What is the biosphere again? Let's take a look at that. La di da, there you go. And here is, the components of it. The biosphere represents really about, mm, about 12 miles of the earth. And the earth is from the, from the surface to the center, roughly th uh, 3,900 miles. So we're talking about a 12 mile on average area where life lives and where it can live and where it needs these components. It needs the atmosphere, it needs the hydrosphere, of course, the water systems, the lithosphere being the rock and mineral areas, albeit most of the life would be in the upper portions where bacteria actually have been found quite a bit in the upper mile or two of the, of the rocky surfaces. And the ecosphere is where it all connects, is the connections between all of these organisms and systems. That makes up the biosphere. And frankly, we should be practicing biospherism and uh, in, a, in a sense, that would just mean to me, um, not just a human-centered ethic, but maybe more than anything, a biosphere-centered ethic or an earth-centered ethic. Earth first, if you don't have a home, it's hard for us to conceive of a healthy future. And so our home is our biosphere. And let's kind of imagine uh, taking a travel into that a little bit. And when we realize this amazing little statistic here, 0.01%, that's a, really a hundredth of 1%. And to think that that's the amount of time in the 3.8 billion year history of life on earth that humans have been on the planet. That's, that's amazing. It's, it's a real humility builder, <laughs> or it should be anyway. Um, humans for the most part are as in terms of primate looking human, uh, human looking primates would be around 250,000 years ago or so, and uh, obviously to the present day. So it's really just at the tip of the story here. Let's make the whole arm and extend even beyond the left side here are mm, representing the 3.8 billion years. Okay, and this is all successful and frankly, quite complex. Sometimes we think of the comp that we're moving toward complexity. I question that. Photosynthesis was invented 
quote unquote, 3.6 billion years ago. Probably one of the most complex systems you can imagine is photosynthesis. And that was invented by types of bacteria as many of us know. And as Lynn Margulis, the great, um, and the great and late friend of ours who was so instrumental and influential in understanding the earth, um, pointed out all the time, the great inventions, the complex inventions were in deep time. And here we are, right here. All the things that you need for life are all invented. We're really, how can I say, uh, additional extras, additional ideas, um, but not necessities. Um, they're all established and well successful through 99.9% uh, of Earth living time. David, you want to add something there? Yeah, that's a... Uh... Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So we're just like fingernails in a way. <laughs> For sure. Like we were saying um, the other day, David, it's like uh, if we keep going the way we are, we're going to be a manicure, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so if uh, it's curious, I mean, it's an interesting perspective that things, because it's kind of thought that things get more complex. So what, why would more... Uh, let's say not more complex than or multicellular creatures and and the large creatures that we're so familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis. Why would they even evolve, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I think it's somewhat speculative. There are probably lots of different answers, and I'm sure uh, you, Dave, and many others would have some good ones. My thoughts on that, um, and it's, it's I guess, uh, just influenced by Lynn and others over time, is that uh, microbes are so successful during this whole period, but at around, we see it 600 million years ago, we see so many m multiple animals and, and plants. I, I just think it's greater degree of versatile and mobile habitats that microbes can live in and utilize. Look at us now, we really have a microbiome. We're a whole ecosystem for microbes. So I think that a lot of the selection natural selection, Darwinian natural selection for, for these multicellularity organisms were in part due to um, uh, the, the need or the advantages for microbes to expand their habitat ranges. But on the other hand, it's not very provable. <laughs> Any other thoughts you have on that, David? That just reminds me of something that Lynn said once, I believe it's in one of the films about her that Humans didn't evolve from bacteria, but bacteria are evolving as us. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Indeed, when you consider that's such a good point, when you consider that there's actually more microbial cells with us right now than human cells. Uh, it's just that we can't see them, so it's a little deceptive. Um, who would have imagined that? So, yeah, so, but all of these organisms are really united that we see in this picture. Uh, and even extending back through that time period, and that they're all members of the Sponge Cafe. <laughs> no, this is not cappuccino. This is a different cafe. This is the uh, Calcium Iron Cafe, CA, Calcium, FE, Iron, Sponge, Sulfur, P, Phosphorus, Oxygen, Nitrogen, Carbon, Hydrogen. I think most of us know that these are pretty important. They are essential. And Maggie is important. We give ownership to Margaret, Maggie, because of the Mg, magnesium. Magnesium is essential for photosynthesis, which really to a large degree is a system that's pretty central to the operation of the biosphere in our lives. All of us are intimately linked and dependent upon photosynthesis, even if you don't eat any vegetables. So the Maggie Sponge Cafe, unites all of these organisms. Look at this stat here. I mean, I don't like to be a stat person, especially in this kind of a thing where we're just connecting sort of informally and which is great, but just, you know, nine elements, nine make up 97 to 99% of every living organism in the biosphere. That means that orchid or the wolf on the left-hand side, ourselves, the fern, whatever, we all have those nine elements making up almost all of us. So the complexity is there, but it's also a streamlined complexity in which you're using as a small amount of the actual materials available. 
and they're central, obviously. And yeah, that's a real wow. Thank you for coming in. <laughs> Uh, so, and while they're all part of the essential bio and geo cycles, these nine, just like our own bodies, too much of any of these elements freely available in the biosphere disrupt establishing working systems and can even be toxic. Well, think about it with, our, with ourselves. If we don't control calcium levels, if our body isn't controlling that, uh, we have a lot of problems. We have heart rate issues, we have heart function issues, we have osteoporosis and mm, bone issues, et cetera, et cetera. Calcium has to be in a control, it's to be feedback systems. And we have that without thinking, without consciousness, just, and just like the biosphere appears to do the same. Calcium is again flowing, but it's also stored, flowing, stored, and it has different mechanisms to do that. We use hormones, the biosphere uses a lot of different organisms to do that. <laughs> Our grand home, the biosphere runs most effectively when there are storage areas known as sinks or platforms because the sinks become grouped together into these giant reefs, okay? We call them platforms in science, but frankly, you can picture a platform that extends, however, for hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles. Let's look at that more closely, but before we do, Dave, any comments from you? Um, so uh, bones are sort of like then, well, the calcium phosphate salts in our bones are sort of like sinks for carb, for calcium in our own bodies, kind of you would say. Yeah, I think of it that way. Do you, do you feel the same or? Yeah, yeah. And it, there's a sense that they might seem like they're permanent, but there's actually a flow to them. I think it's part of human nature to look at things and, and not to focus as much on flows, but as you were saying with the hormones, and calcium is regulated between nine and 11 milligrams per hundred milliliters of blood. Right. It's the most, most uh, finely regulated element in the body. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. And that's a, that's a good point. And because it really is finely regulated to put it really clear. Here we see an example of a place which, which um, is really involved with this calcium flow. And this is Florida, which was a Ponce de Leon name. It is not the name, obviously, of the many indigenous tribes that were in that part of the world. But in this case, this is long before there were any humans uh, <clears throat> or any primates. This is 500 million years ago. Florida, we now know, was in this bedrock, uh, this ancient uh, Gondwana land, this un unification of what later became separate continents. Uh, on the west side of Africa, okay? And at this point, there was no calcium carbonate of any great degree uh, thought to be in existence there. Maybe little traces of it, mostly more uh, granitic material, volcanic material, and so on. And that's 500 million years ago, originally part of Africa, and at the equator 500 million years ago, or, or actually below uh, Boston, an area actually was probably near the equator at that time. What we know is Florida and the seas around it evolved as an important storage of calcium and carbon, and to some degree remains such today, as we'll see. And here we see in this picture of 50 million years ago, uh, 50 million years ago, Florida is completely underwater. <clears throat> and many of our states actually, including New York State, New Mexico and others, have been underwater many times during its uh, geological evolution, if you will. But this was Florida here underwater. And here you have calcium developing, calcium really forming big plates, major growths uh, of calcium, meaning the calcium coming from organisms that died, mostly microbes, really, and form these carbonate platforms where all of this area underwater is just covered with calcium extending many meters below and carbon as well. A great storage but yet also one day to become an important flow. <clears throat> but the question is here, uh, but how, who's doing this? What organisms are involved with something like this? And of course, whenever you do that, you come to some microorganism and there you have it. These, uh, in this case, it's Melibesia, which is a red alga. Um, it's not quite microscopic, or at least it, it forms kind of colonies and grows on seagrass. 
people might say, well, this is just some esoteric sidebar. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Well, it really is a major sector of the planet and of the biosphere. And is a great example that we should have in mind of, again, the storage and the kind of controlling flow that the biosphere has. This is all, all this white material is calcium that's being deposited by these algae. And as they die out, the calcium stays on the grass for a while, but then it actually will drop into the bottom and form the sediment that keeps getting thicker and, and the grass keeps growing through it and growing another layer and so on. So much so that these are sometimes 20 meters thick in some places off the Florida coast, <clears throat> covering hundreds of square miles. This is a calcium carbonate platform and it exists today. And in fact, all of Florida, as you know, is under jeopardy, is in jeopardy. Under jeopardy? Hmm, maybe under jeopardy too. In that much of Florida is calcium carbonate right to the surface and therefore very porous and water can seep in even apart from the coastline. <clears throat> Let's look at another example, but before we do that, Dave, any thoughts? Uh, just, uh, I, I always thought that humans in apartment buildings are sort of like coral reefs mm -hmm. and that in a way that we're depositing calcium in the form of like building materials right. too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. I think the uh, difference there is that <clears throat> we tend to carry, have the, the, the baggage of so many toxins that we're depositing with the building. <laughs> uh, well, there's probably not quite as many in the, in the biosphere area. This is another example of a calcium deposit. This is on a broad scale. It's on a big time scale. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this is a look at the North Atlantic Ocean here and the white uh, view from the air is, um, uh, showing the Scottish coastline near the Hebrides in, uh, off of Scotland, Hebrides Islands. And here is a bloom. It's not a cloud. It's in the water, in the upper reaches of an alga. And believe me, I would not lie to you. This is believed to be the most common eukaryote, the most common organism outside of a bacteria in the world. This is Emiliana. It's a mouthful, Emiliana. And it's in off the coast of Scotland. And it's there much of the year at different times of the year, every year, albeit susceptible now clearly to climate changes uh, and mostly human caused climate changes. But they photosynthesize and, and they are a wow just looking at them as you see in this picture. This is a, this is all of that cloud area that you really can't see one of them with the naked eye, but yet there are uncountable numbers of them there in the seas and the North Atlantic. And these are the, these beautiful shells are calcium carbonate that they have a, uh, a loving for, a liking for and assimilating into their metabolism and into their body. And they're really as partly a protection as well as giving great buoyancy as they absorb a lot of um, other organisms and photosynthesize in the waters. An elegant shelled microscopic alga, the shells in science terms would be called tests, T-E-S-T-S, -E but we can call them shells for now. And uh, a major land topography builder, uh, important calcium and carbon storage and recycling much like the example off of Florida, only this is really widespread. This is really significant without sounding really ridiculous. If we drill down outside of Notre Dame Cathedral in France for a good, I don't know, 10, 15 meters at least, we would drill through coccoliths. It's a calcium carbonate platform throughout much of Europe. Uh, and that was once underwater, but rose up as we'll see in a picture shortly. And this whole calcium carbonate area extends right out into the oceanic areas where we just saw that picture here off of, off of here, uh, Scotland. But throughout this whole area, uh, this is 
thousands really of square miles of calcium carbonate deposition, if you will, deposited there over time. And thankfully, okay, the biosphere quote knows what it's doing, unquote. It has these feedback mechanisms that whereas organisms are part of this movement of the sponge cafe, and in this case, calcium again, being stored, utilized, but then released um, only gradually at times. <clears throat> Along those lines, Doug, uh, yeah. you mentioned climate and, and sort of like feedback loops. Uh, do you think, and, and the fact that these things also store carbon, do you think there's like a sort of Gaian level response possible as a result of warming climate that might in some ways compensate with larger blooms, for example, of coccolithophores? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, the problem with that is that the coccolithophores, which is the name of these beautiful uh, little algae, they, um, <clears throat> they, they have um, water temperature limitations so that their compensation would be uh, as well limited unless there's just some variance there that will respond and we don't know that. It's sort of the same with the coral algae, but it's a great question. The compensation may be one that occurs over long periods of time and that other organisms sort of fill in a little bit, um, but it's a good point. And certainly we know now that when we talk about endangered organisms or threatened ones that we, that we really need in all of our food chains and biosystems, we don't think sometimes about the microbes like this one. And um, another reason for, for us to uh, put earth-centered ethics number one. <laughs> good point though, good question. Here's the way it works though. When you see these coccoliths, they die, they go to the bottom of the ocean. This is the ocean. This is from uh, Guy and Folks, uh, Lynn and uh, <clears throat> James Lovelock put this together. Uh, of luck, just give me permission to use them. This is, uh, this is um, the coccolith gathering and at the bottom of the sea and the sea above it. Over time, the, it goes above the sea level due to glaciation period <clears throat> or interglacial periods. Uh, but in this case, uh, a lot through just volcanic action as well. And so the coccoliths are now, the calcium carbonate storage is now above ground. There's forests and ecosystems above, it rains, it's the calcium carbonate is kind of soluble in different places. It breaks down as we, we know, limestone breaks down, uh, particularly when exposed to the elements that way and not protected. So you get these little hills forming and you get these cracks, these beginning caves in here, or it's more soluble. And over time you get these hills as so much has eroded, has washed down and yet leaving these hills and there are so many examples, not always as dramatic around the world in our topography, in our world that we don't really think of as life created, but this is in China and uh, in uh, Zhuyan area where this is where all this is, not necessarily all coccolis, it may be other calcium carbonate, for example, calcareous sponges. Sponges, believe it or not, also make these giant reefs as I found out in Poland, where I thought I was going to see coral reefs embedded in the, in the mountainside there. And I was rapidly pointed out that it was all massive um, reefs of sponges, ancient animals. So look at this fabulous picture. This is a picture from uh, organisms that were once alive. This is all geology that was once alive. And it's building these mountains and our habitats now for new biodiversity. Wow. Wow. I love I just to interrupt briefly. I just love that uh, Annie spelled out coccolithophore because it literally means earth carrier. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Good point. And the coccolith is the, the lith is the earth material, right? The lithosphere, the coccolith. <clears throat> Good point. Here's another example. Look at this. That's not a steak on the right side. For you, you meat eaters, you think you think that's not a steak. That's a, a Bahama Island. This is looking down and these are all reefs from the air. This is a healthy coral reef. But look at, you can't have a reef. You cannot have a reef involving coral unless it's infected by a microbe in a microalgae. And there it is. 
It will not build a calcium carbonate reef. It will not store calcium. It will not store carbon, although it will the carbon will pass through because it's photosynthesizing, but only photosynthesizing when the algae has infected it. This is infection in the positive sense of the word. It's going inside and it becomes a partner with the organism. This is one plus one equals one, as Lynn would say, right? One plus one always equals two, we thought. No, more often than not, it equals one because it's building a community here that is completely dependent on each other to build a reef. And the reef is necessary as a kind of home for its larvae and as a place where it can settle and grow, the coral animal. And this is the polyp animal. This is, the, this is part of the animal. The reef is not pictured here, except in this broader picture here. And down below, these hard parts underneath. And of course, now we, with climate change issues, we're seeing the death of some of these corals as we see in the white. But these are massive uh, uh, areas. Look at this picture in uh, China again of a coral reef that's a mountaintop. It looks like a coral reef. And that's all calcium carbonate from coral reef that was once in the ocean, many thousands of me uh, meters below. <clears throat> and this picture here, Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico. This is a coral reef that has been differentially made soluble where it's breaking apart in different areas and forming caves. And look at this, this is also an extension of the reef. Calcium carbonate, maybe coccolith, maybe sponges, but definitely calcium carbonate from living organisms in large part, not 100%, but a good percentage of the Empire State Building the um, Washington National Cathedral on the left and the Pentagon here. A lot of that is calcium carbonate. It's just put in these, the reason why this, this might be a problematic, well, I don't know, can we think of any reasons why this might be problematic to compare with a biosphere? Why isn't this just the natural extension of the biosphere? How come we're not shooting praise on these structures like we might with, with coral reefs? Dave, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it's sort of like, I mean, I always thought that humans, you know, are natural. Why not? We are natural. Isn't everything nature? And mm -hmm. I kind of reminded of the George Carlin comedy skit that, you know, God invented humans so that it could put plastic into the, the biosphere. <laughs> and actually there was a paper recently that plastic is now cycling globally like a biogeochemical cycle. So it does beg the question, isn't this just natural? Isn't yeah. This, does, does, do humans imitate life? Well, yeah, and I think, you know, to me, the answer is pretty clear cut in that um, we just carry so much baggage with it. This has such a infrastructure, a common word of today, right? Infrastructure built into it, that's toxic. Uh, the plastic, as you mentioned, which, as we know, even if it has some cycles to it, they are toxic cycles. They're in our bodies. They can confer, in some cases, a disease, and they certainly are killing off fishes. So again, many of these structures, they're built, they're human built, but they're not a fit in with the biosphere. Instead, they are a compilation coming from brain power uh, rather than from feedback mechanisms as to what can work in the biosphere. And these systems, obviously can't work in the biosphere. <clears throat> they intend, they, in fact, when we see them, they're taking the place really of wetlands and forests and things that worked for, and systems that worked for millions of years. This hasn't worked for millions of years. They've only been there for a few decades. And again, they have this, look at all those, all those cars on the front, yeah. They have all these vehicles here, they're gonna burn more fossil fuel that require tons of mining to get that iron ore out. So they're disruptive of the ecosystems just to build this disrupts hundreds of square miles of ecosystems around the world. <clears throat> so bring me true. One last thing we'll, I wanna go through here. I'll go through uh, quickly. I know I'm a, I'm a clock watcher too, but um, I'm glad you're all staying with us. This is fun stuff and important stuff. This is Chad, this is uh, Big country in Africa, it's as big as California, I think Montana, 
and Texas put together in Africa. And, uh, and we depend upon Chad uh, greatly. If we think the Amazon is important, then we depend upon Chad. And the Amazon, I think we all agree is important. It brings down a lot of carbon. It helps to um, supply uh, the water flow on the planet. Uh, it's a home for great biodiversity, which we know is essential on the planet. Speaking of diversity, this is a kind of biodiversity, a diversity of humans. These are all different peoples and tribes of Chad and a low carbon footprint. This would not be third world by, if the earth could speak to us, this would be first world because its carbon footprint and its toxic footprint is very low. We might call it poor, but that again, wouldn't be fair. They may not, poor doesn't necessarily have to be judged on amount of wealth or kind of capitalist definition. <clears throat> and Chad is important because Chad is the link um, to the Amazon. It's a profound example of global ecology, the connections over great distances, which is what I teach, what I try to do, connections over great distances and of biosphere reciprocity. Biosphere seems to have materials and elements flowing one way and then flowing back, flowing one way, flowing back, flowing in different directions. It's reciprocal, much like indigenous people have thought for many years and that we need to begin to think about. And here's the picture going right across. There you go. How is this happening? Well, here it's all of this mineral dust. Do you see it up in the air here, up in this picture here? It's being lifted in the air by volcanic, uh, by winds between some ancient volcanoes. And it's lifting up this mineral dust and it's moving it right across the Atlantic at different times during the year. <clears throat> Millions of tons really in a year. And this is the Tipitini Yasuni area where I've led several trips there. And it's a very rich, one of the most biodiverse areas in the world, but its soils are weak. They're old, they're weak and they're being drained a lot by heavy rains. And lo and behold, a lot of the iron and minerals that come from the desert area, uh, but it, look at this, it was part of a lake at one point. So the desert is rich, and why is it rich? Because it has the dead remnants of this microbe, a diatome, an alga. And what is this diatome? It includes a lot of minerals in it, including in its shell, silica, but also it carries with it bits of iron, phosphorus, and other members of the sponge cafe. And indeed other organisms actually travel on it in the winds across the Atlantic. There it is, here's the mountains, one here and one here, volcanic. Here's the winds coming from Libya, picks up the mineral dust and goes across the Atlantic and eventually to the Amazon. <clears throat> Look at this stat here, 0.2% of the Sahara significantly fertilizes the 2.1 million square miles of the Amazon rainforest over 5,000 miles away. Are you kidding me? No, we're not. And look at here, this is the diatomes. This is, the, this is all the microbes piled up, all the shells of them being picked up by the winds. Winds from a narrow passage between two dormant volcanoes carry 25 to 40 million tons each year of mineral dust, mostly these tests, these shells from this Bodele region, this part of Sahara that we're talking about, as well as from this El Dwarf region, which is in Mauritania, a little bit to the west of Chad. And additional millions of it go to, uh, go to portions of the Atlantic Ocean, not just to the Amazon. So the flow of elements in the biosphere is uh, aerial a lot being carried by winds from east to west and that eventually are, are fall into these areas and become part of the upper portions of the soil. Here we can see how much is being removed in just a year's time. One meter extending really over dozens of miles is being lifted up and brought across. All of this used to be alive, so it's all now dead um, algae that once lived in the lake that is now dried out, but appears to get more water in cycles over time. Although again, under threat from climate change. Here's an example, look at that brownish material here. This is 
some of the mineral dust on the north and west side of this hurricane looking, but it's a low pressure system, a strong one off the African coast, heading this away toward um, South America. And look at this, look at the trees, as many of you know, in the Amazon, they don't have deep roots like we do here. The roots are mostly above ground. These are root cells here. These are buttress roots. The cells are, uh, are root cells, not trunk cells. And if we dug down here, we'd, they'd see you'd only go down really a meter, not five and 10 meters even, the way we have many of our trees here. And the reason why, yeah, buttress roots, and this one of a large fig in Yasuni, these roots do not reach deep into the ground because most nutrients are very near the surface and are brought into the root cells via these fungi. Now you see them here on the surface and these here actually are with go inside the roots and transfer the goodies, transfer the sponge cafe, mostly iron and phosphorus to the tree roots. And much of that iron and phosphorus comes from the Sahara mineral dust. Yikes. So this is an example with a soil, you don't wanna mess with it. It's kind of weak, it's been drained, it's been there a long time. Amazon's been near the equator and lots of rain, so. And it's very important, it allows really all of this green forest because the iron is part of this uh, protein called ferrodoxin that you need for photosynthesis. You can't have any of these trees unless you get enough iron. And then that of course contributes to water vapor being formed and you get these wonderful storm systems that feed back and give rain to the uh, rainforest, but also go around the planet and maybe even bring some rain here as we see in beautiful Quabbin Reservoir. Likely there is some rain from those storms that originated in the Amazon. So in that way, another way we're connected to Chad, let's be clear here on that. Ancient and recent microbial life, okay. They're in Lake Chad as Lake Chad dries up in parts in the country of Chad, okay. They die, they get picked up by winds every day and are brought to different areas or carried, they're not brought, they don't have a mind. They're carried by the winds <clears throat> to South America as well as some in the Atlantic Ocean. That in turn allows for clouds and low pressure and rain systems, not only is important for the tree growth and, and uh, the forest to be healthy, but it also contributes to the air above it, which fosters more rain and water vapor. <clears throat> and that in turn becomes recycled back to North Africa in some, some years, not very often, <laughs> but in some years. And it certainly comes back to the, to the rainforest and to other parts of the globe to a lesser degree as low pressure systems. So in a way, there's multiple cycles going on here involving movement of sponge cafe material, iron and phosphorus in particular, to take care of probably the most important natural place or one of them that we can think of, the Amazon. Yeah, okay. And look at all this biodiversity. This is all pictures I took in the Amazon. And there's a lot of biodiversity here. And who would have thunk, again, sorry, using the same phrase, but that it's coming from a desert, coming from Bodele and Mauritania to a large degree, not 100%, but still pretty remarkable. And these are pretty remarkable creatures and they're part of the world that we have to obviously be protecting and protecting the indigenous people that are there. And speaking of them, this is a cover of a calling home the website and the now the magazine that we put out. It's a great addition. Please copy this down. Worth calling home. It has an article about biospherism in it that you should read. But really the whole issue is, a, is an important read written really by former students who are now colleagues and, and others. So check it out, write it down, la di da. Thank you all for your attention. Now it's time for questions, right? Yeah, your presentation was so full of questions, Doug. And um, 
I, I have to say, I love this whole discussion because to me, and it's nothing original with me, to me, biology is the most powerful force on planet Earth. And we, we address climate, biodiversity for livable climate. But when we have conversations with mainstream climate scientists and others, um, it's, they, don't, they don't get that at all. They're all about technology and physics and chemistry, and they don't see the biology. And so that is, I would think, uh, one of the most important things about what you're presenting today. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that is changing a bit. I have so many colleagues who are climate scientists, much more expert than I am, and they are they're talking about the importance of biodiversity that's overlooked so often and, and so on. So I see that really as uh, changing, lots of warnings coming out in the last, especially five to six years, maybe overdue, your point is well taken, but I think it's, it's changed dramatically. There's more of an openness to seeing how life really needs to be uh, supported and that we need to be mimicking the biosphere more than, than being an outlier. I think where we continue to operate, in my opinion, it comes down a lot to lifestyles as well, that we continue to be in lifestyles that are unsupportable for the future. Uh, we can't keep covering up ecosystems like just looking out the window here. Yep. Whatever wetlands and places, we can't keep doing that. There's so much more to it than that simplic, simplistic representation, which you've shown us in your slides mm -hmm. and how across the planet, everything's attached to everything else. Yeah. There is, and if you ruin one piece, you're ruining the whole thing. It's, it's a system. But uh, let me get to a couple of questions here from our uh, audience. And Doug, could you uh, close your slides down so Annie oh. can reclaim oh, the- Oh yeah, so I should stop the share, right? Yes, oh. great, Thank, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so one person asks, how has uh, biologist Lynn Margulis informed your work? And we know that that's a, it's not a trick question. <laughs> uh, Dave, do you wanna uh, chime in first on that? Well, I remember going to grad school at BU and uh, you know, thinking that life started 700 million years ago. And then my first evolution class with Lynn learned that it was 3.8 billion years ago. Uh, you know, it's just completely life transforming, you know, just uh, turning things on their heads. You know, my whole perspective of life just completely changed. And, and you know, everything that she's talked about is actually being borne out now. I mean, Doug mentioned the mycorrhizal fungi. I mean, they're, they're actually botanists who are talking, using the words intelligence to talk about forests and plants now by virtue of the kinds of information that they're exchanging using the mycorrhizae and they're performing cognitive feats, you know? Uh, and I think it's an inter entering anthropology now as well. There's a book by Eduardo Cohn, uh, mm -hmm. How Forests Think, yeah. you know, anthropology beyond the human. And in a way, you know, he said that, the, that these creatures don't have a mind, or, you know, these dead creatures don't have a mind being transported across the 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 ocean i've actually seen that believe it or not in the amazon um, mm -hmm. the dust particles uh but in a way that's isn't that you mentioned also that if the earth could speak to us you know but isn't that in a way the earth speaking to us sure yeah I, that's a good point I, just that from my standpoint we we're still using the human reference point a mind a brain and so forth and I think the brain, as we see in all of our constructs that we have, is a bit of an outlier or almost an outlaw. It doesn't really fit. None of these systems that we're talking about are doing this with a brain in the sense that, that our bodies, we gave the example of calcium before, we're not thinking about that, those hormones that need to then sequester the calcium. It's part of the feedback systems. And to me, I think that's a, that's a, a very special kind of intelligence and it's the kind that we need to be more aware of to fit in with the planet better. We should be more aware of it. But yeah, Lynn was so, I mean, you know, originally we wanted to make a microbial museum, um, but it, that, that was kind of hard to, to do, but we got into 
than a whole curriculum program with that. But she certainly was one of the real great influences in my life across the board. I, I never realized that symbiosis would be that important. And she insisted I you know, run for president of the Symbiosis Society and this thing and the other. Um, and I usually did a lot of things that she said, but great influence over time, no question about it. Uh, miss her a great deal. She continue to be enlightening us today. So we have another question and, and this kind of pops up while we're in the middle of a pandemic. And that is, uh, were viruses around at the beginning? And, and what are they for anyway? Oh yeah, great question. Um, yeah, viruses right now as we speak, all, all of us have uh, really several tens of thousands, if not millions of viruses in and on our body. Um, a head of cabbage has at least 50,000 in it, studies have shown. <laughs> they really have been part of the earth. They're not a living thing. There's, uh, as Lynn, in fact, would, uh, taught me originally and showed repeatedly that um, <clears throat> they don't have all of the necessary um, attributes or systems that life would have, but they are uh, important transfer of genetic material. And frankly, they've been important in life's history because they're moving genes through uh, the uh, attachment to other bacteria uh, from one place to another. Um, and they have a great uh, influence on bacterial genes. And we do know that a good portion of our own body's genes originally were um, from various bacteria that inhabited us. We know that from the Genome Project and from studies leading up to 2012. So. So viruses are part of this. Um, and this whole virus issue today is in part, in my view, and in some of the initial studies that are happening now, our thoughts, we keep expanding into biodiverse areas. And, and again, the biosphere and biodiverse areas seem to have ways of controlling um, different expressions of genetic material. But when we encroach upon it, we expose ourselves. In this case, maybe through wildlife uh, markets, but whatever, we're encroaching upon that biospheric biodiversity world, and we need to back off from that. Um, but viruses are important in our whole development. Okay, um, let's see what else we've got in the Q&A here. Um, do, you th do you think that um, areas of historic calcium storage have any relevancy to where reef systems are located now? Hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that uh, it depends. The reefs have been scattered in so many areas. They're obviously, they have to be, the reefs have to be in subtropical and tropical areas, literally down to as far as about 25 degrees north and south of the equator and in that area. So it really depends a lot on the movement of the continents over time, uh, which is another force that's similar to the force of, of living organisms. Uh, but in terms of, um, how can I say, the corals being necessarily one place as opposed to another, I think it's very dependent upon that, upon that movement. Uh, that being said, at this time, um, they're all under threat. Um, uh, and uh, they're, they're, it's very hard for them to recover with those temperatures getting above 31 degrees centigrade and, 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 and for extended periods of time. Uh, anything you want to add to that, David? No, I think you're right. I mean, it all depends on how things move around and get shifted in the deposition and uplift of yeah. geologic time. Uh, other than, you know, it's the current living storage that's happening right now. Uh, but yeah, the threat, the threat to the uh, coral reefs from um, global climate change is really quite alarming. Yeah. Okay. Um, can, here's a question about, about the dust from, from Africa. Considering what happens what comes from the Sahara, should we try to be reclaiming it as a forest or grassland? Well, the, the dust that comes from there actually um, 
is part of a, a process that involves the, a, a huge lake, one of the largest lakes known at one time. <clears throat> 7,000 years ago, it was really the largest lake probably in the world, but it, it's gone back and forth. It's in the sense that it's dried out and, 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 be, and thankfully it has, in this case, it's, it's good that it's gone through this drought periods because again, this mineral dust wouldn't be uh, available. Uh, wouldn't be influencing the biosphere. So there's been certain triggers that have allowed the, the, the dead organisms to then move the mineral dust around in the ways that they have. Human intervention to me <clears throat> would only interfere with that. Um, there's not that much evidence that <clears throat> that kind of intervention um, when something is already working, so to speak, um, is, is uh, something that should be done. Um, now, if climate change occurs to such a degree that the winds change in that area, I still would say that we shouldn't be intervening in that process. Um, and also, when we start talking about the desert, remember, it's a certain pigmentation, albedo, the attraction uh, and the reflection of light is very important to the Earth's biosphere and to our survival. <laughs> Um, so that we, we have to be careful about altering uh, areas that are light colored because they don't grow things on it, for example, um, or grow as much as we would want. Dave, do you have any comment about that? No, other than uh, just to remark uh, just how amazing it is that we can even think at these scales now. <laughs> yeah and respect the system that works, you know, over such spatio-temporal scales. I think uh, we've got time for uh, one or two more questions. Um, here's a question about whether you feel concerned, we should be concerned about the movement of the poles. Do you, do you think that the activity, the underground activity recently is related to that. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not familiar with that either. Okay. So Other than to say that. that I know that, you know, they've changed in the past, so. <laughs> right. Um, and, and, and to say that nature is nonlinear, so things can stay the same for long periods of time and then go through rapid change. Mm -hmm. And it looks to me like we're already seeing that. Uh, what seeing, seeing what? What did, what did you mean? Seeing now? the rapid change. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the 180,000 years of, of temperatures or uh, carbon dioxide um, in a narrow range up to around 290. And, mm -hmm. and now here we are at 415 or so. Uh, that's a pretty rapid change. Yeah, we see this kind of explosion. And to me, a lot of these explosions are, uh, are the one thing that people don't pay much attention to. Uh, and I, I don't, I'm not very popular when I say these things, but our lifestyles do not fit. There's no other organisms. We're the only organism on the planet that's doing the things that we do, um, constructing things, uh, taking lithium, mining beyond belief, destroying ecosystems because we want more things. Uh, that's just not a future fit. I can't see how the biosphere is going to be biodiverse and continue uh, well in the future uh, without human beings being willing to make some changes, particularly modern day human beings. Um, I think indigenous peoples have had less of that footprint and we should learn from their reciprocity. Yeah, I think that that's a very important point at this point in history. Okay. Uh, final question. Is the biosphere an autopoietic system? Uh -huh. Is itself, I would interpret that is, is itself organizing? Oh yeah, Dave, you can start with this. Yeah, that's a, that's a popular word that Lynn used to use. I yeah. like it because it's the same, same root for poetry, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so it is, it's a self-organizing complex system, emergent. And uh, it's speaking to us <laughs> as such. 
Yeah, and just by its resilience through over three billion years, I mean, uh, it's it's um, the biosphere again is reacting and and changing and fitting in, albeit sometimes over long periods of time that that humans uh, can't really fit into. But nevertheless, we, we see that kind of, and in a sense, that's kind of a little bit what we were trying to demonstrate today. This, this, this flow of, uh, of uh, elements is important. And it's one that shows, I think, that, the, um, that there is an ongoing system here, a uh, feedback system in particular, um, that keeps these sponge cafe rolling. Okay, with that in mind, let's all keep this sponge cafe rolling. Uh, thank you so much, Dave and Doug. It's, uh, you know, you've, you've got uh, a podcast or a show coming, Dave, the Dave and Doug show. <laughs> and um, we look forward to that. <laughs> okay. Well, you would be our first guest because uh, you had a lot of nice stuff. Uh, bright thoughts and and happy moments too so thank you all very much thank you for tuning in this has been great and thank you david for sharing the platform it's been really uh an, a fun important exercise and thank you very much to our audience uh from bio for climate and from gbh